Hey, how's it going? Welcome back to the channel. I'm here with Desha, who is one of the core contributors to the CASPA network. Uh, you've probably seen that it's getting a lot of buzz lately. It, everyone seems to be talking about it. So um, he's here, going to answer some questions about the tech, the general goals of the project. Hopefully, I'm going to be asking those questions. We'll see. And, uh, and we're kind of just going to go from there and have a conversation. So, Desha. Nice Hi. to meet you. Thanks for coming on. Tell us a little bit. How did you get started with Casper Network, and like, what's your what's your background and experience? Uh, okay. Well, uh, my background is uh, academic. Uh, I you could say I kind of stumbled into Casper almost by uh, mistake. Uh, I used to be interested a little bit about uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum and uh, all the stuff that happens like between uh, 2010 and 2015. And I kind of lost interest. And then uh, during my uh, second or third year of, the, of my PhD, um, I was assigned to TA a class in, uh, in Introduction to Algorithms. And uh, I've, I look at the other guys who I would, would be ta with, and one of them was this guy called uh, Jonathan Sompolinski. I've never heard of him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and that's how things started. Um, one day uh, he, I talked to him about crypto. He told me he does crypto stuff, uh, that uh, his advisor is Aviv Zohar, and Aviv Zohar, for anyone who doesn't know, is a legend. Uh, you, should, you should look him up. He's, uh, he's, he has some very strong contributions to the crypto space. And uh, I was impressed by the fact that he's working with Aviv. Uh, I didn't care too much for crypto at the time. Uh, I didn't know much about his work. And then, then uh, one day he told me something about that time when he and Aviv uh, published Ghost. And I said, you didn't publish Ghost. I mean, you must mean something else. Uh, Ghost is this thing that uh, the Ethereum implemented. And he said, yes, yes, that's us. And I was like, okay. And then uh, <laughs> I realized he's uh, kind of a big shot. And then he <laughs> told me... <laughs> He told me about uh, about Spectre and about Ghost Dog, and he told me that uh, I told him why I, I didn't care much for crypto at the time because it seems like um, nothing really happens, and the problems that uh, for adoption, the problems that make this uh, technology useful just don't seem to get solved. I just hear people talk for years about how any minute now the Lightning Network is gonna solve all problems. And yeah. it just doesn't happen. And told me, yeah, well, I solved it. And I'm like, ah, no, you didn't. Um, and he told me about Spectre and about Phantom. And it took me a while, but I remember this point of clarity where I read about Phantom. And I was like, my God, th this seems to actually work. And then he told me that he's uh, going to, to start a company and start developing this thing. And, and he asked me if I want to join. And I said... Uh, no, no way. I'm not going into crypto. I don't really believe in crypto. But I have a good friend whose dream was always to develop a new crypto tech from the ground up. Um, his name is Mike Zack. Uh, you can uh, uh, have his details. And I uh, am interconnected between the two. And I think that's how I may uh, inadvertently cause Douglas to, to be the way it is. I think Mike was... Uh, the first employee, which wasn't like a founder VC, the first like developer on board and started the whole thing. So I think my first main contribution to Casper was just like uh, I brought along a friend, which was uh, um, um, suited for the job. And then, um, because uh, Mike is a really good friend of mine, which I, I used to see like a lot, he kept telling me what's going on and how they proceed. and. Uh, and Yoni, like, every once in a while contacted me and told me what's going on. And, like, there was this implicit pressure for me to join. And at some point, I, I cracked. I said, okay, this is, this is moving forward. This is cool. Um, I want to be a part of this. I'm sure you regret yeah. that decision wholeheartedly at this point. Sometimes, yeah. <laughs> really? Yeah, there, are, there, there were hard moments. Um, yeah. And I joined board. At the start, I was, like, uh, um, I think my... My, uh, they didn't want to give me a resource position because I was in a, a part-time job because mm -hmm. I was uh, still am a student. I still didn't finish my PhD. Uh, I would have finished it if it wasn't for Casper. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Priorities. 
Man, um, you make more money with Caspa than you would with your PhD, anyways. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I guess know. I definitely made more Caspa, more uh, magical internet money. Um, so, um, at the, so my initial uh, uh, title was spec writer. Uh, like my job was to to understand how things um, are supposed to work to the finest details and spec them out very well because um, I also came with experience in like uh, writing. In in Hebrew, I used to write a lot of uh, popular science for uh, for uh, large uh, popular science outlets. I like to talk, uh, to write about quantum computation and about uh, math in general. I really like uh, abstract useless math. And uh, <laughs> uh, so we, we try to apply this, uh, but uh, you know, I would come to, to the office like twice, three times a week and there would be um, discussions about problems that need solving and I would get involved and uh, like uh, two, three months, within two, three months, they're like, okay, you're not a spec writer. <laughs> you never write any specs. You just do theories. So you're, okay, you're a researcher. Fine. Okay. <laughs> so um, that's how uh, it evolved. Um, and uh, I think uh, the two contributions I'm proud of the most are that uh, I came up with, the, with our approach to difficulty adjustment. Um, you, should I explain what difficulty adjustment is? Um, let's get, is that, is that like dag night, ghost dag kind of? No, uh, no, it's a uh, difficult adjustment is, is very basic. You also have it in Bitcoin. Okay. Yeah, it's you can, just, yeah, you can share that. It's just this, uh, this mechanism, which uh, determines, um, how hard it would be to find a, a hash. Uh, how hard do you need to work to, um, to find a block, which oh, is like, like if you have more miners, then you need to increase the difficulty so that right. the block rate would uh, stay regulated. Mm -hmm. So doing it on blockchain in itself is not very simple. And doing it on DAG was a, a whole other story. And uh, this was like my first big uh, independent research project to find a way to do this well on DAGs. Um, another thing which was, I think, um, I think at some point we all agreed it was actually harder than, than coming up with ghost dog was to come up with a way to prune ghost dog, like how to throw away old right. blocks um, without uh, compromising security. And that's just, uh, because, that's just because there's so much data, right? That yes, yes. You need to a centralization problem. Exactly. You need uh, to only keep like, a fixed length um, uh, prefix, uh, suffix of the data. You, you can't uh, store the entire... Like, there are archival nodes. You need them so you could verify. But to, in order to run a node, you can't store all of the history. It's mm -hmm. prohibitive when you have 30 blocks per second or one block per second. It's just not realistic. So it's absolutely essential for the technology to be viable. And it proved to be a very, very difficult problem. Me and uh, Jonathan and, uh, and Michael Sutton, yeah. we worked on it very hard for very for quite a few months, maybe even a year. At some point, I was even convinced it's mathematically impossible. But uh, then we found a way. We found a way which could, uh, which is probably secure. And this was like uh, uh, one of my proudest achievements. And I think another contribution, which is more theoretical, is that uh, I uh, wrote the security proof for why GhostDev is secure. Okay. Uh, before uh, there wasn't a secure, there was a flawed security proof. Um, and uh, to complete the security proof turned out to be much harder than we, we anticipated. Mm -hmm. And I think discussing my proof, uh, when Saturn came on board, I told him about my proof and what I'm doing. And I think. I think this was one of the first uh, sparks that allowed him to come up with this amazing innovation called Dagnite. I think we'll get uh, a bit later to what is Dagnite and what's the difference between Ghost Dag and Dagnite. Yeah, yep. I still have, because I, I have some, um, I mean, that's an awesome introduction. So what, what, were, what are the time frames there? I think I read somewhere that you got in essentially around like 2018. It was when you started really contributing or was it? Yeah, I'm going to say something ironic. I'm not very good with numbers. Um, 
<laughs> okay, fair yeah, enough. We, we I, don't, I was just curious, like trying to figure it's out the time. Either 2017 or 2018, I worked for uh, in Douglas for uh, two, three years. Uh, okay. I can tell you that uh, my last day in Douglas was the last day of 2021. Okay. Um, uh, so it was like last day of 2020. No, it was. The main, it was the last day of 2020. I'm sorry. Okay, I was going to say, because uh, last day of 2021, it had just was launched, after right? Main and right, launch. November. I left yeah. before the testnet launched. Right. And so, yeah, that, that's what uh, sounds okay. odd about it. Last day of 2020, right. It was uh, the last day of the COVID year, and it's COVID-19. Yeah, yeah. you see numbers. Uh, yeah, <laughs> okay. So, yeah, I, uh, I left at the last day of 2020. And then uh, I I wanted to go to finish my PhD full time, and then uh, mainnet launched and uh, sucked me right back in. <laughs> so, okay. um, so yeah, so these are the time frames. Okay. And well, then, so, uh, that's the story with Caspa. So okay, awesome. So Caspa, if I if I have this correctly, is essentially it's somewhat of it's basically Bitcoin, except it's built different, obviously. It's uh, it's got generalized Nakamoto consensus versus just regular Nakamoto consensus. I want to ask you about that and what the uh, yeah. risk the risk reward might be on changing that. But like, so Caspa is trying to be more scalable, and that's why it's got the blocks per second. I think you guys are working up to like thirty to thirty two blocks per yes. second with this Rust rewrite is going to allow that mm -hmm. somehow. So I was wondering. What, so who who is the real competition here? So I'm going to share my screen because in your, by the way, this is uh, Desh's Twitter. Go follow him on Twitter. But he's got, it, it says here, uh, CAS will replace LTC, Litecoin. Mm -hmm. And then over here in this article, the Onaton, he also mentions uh, Litecoin. But he also mentions... I believe in this one lightning network. And then I've heard in the discord, people say, no one's going to tell you this, but we're really trying to compete with Bitcoin. So which is it? Like what exactly, what are you guys, who, who are you competing with? What do you think is the closest one? Like you mentioned already lightning. It seems to be stuck. Like they're at like 5,000, 5,200. It's glow. It's growing, but like not by much. And it's like, is there going to be a better system? Because I saw that you guys had this exchange. Mm -hmm. uh, you're talking about the the community, and it's awesome. And Yonatan says here, admirably, saw, you know, referring to you, you admirably yes. saw Casper happening when it wasn't cool yet, right? When it wasn't at a penny. And uh, Lightning was still thinking, I'm, I'm not doing price predictions. None of this is financial advice. But I'm, just, I'm just playing, right? Yeah, well, very tongue-in-cheek here also. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, right, right. We, we so, are Israelis. We have a lot of chutzpah. Right, for sure. So after after every lightning, there's a thunder, you say. I know what you're alluding to here. And he says, which shatters the watchtower. So you guys are using some buzzwords there. And typically lasts much longer, which is awesome. So I really do like this exchange. I personally, I like that Litecoin to me is kind of, I don't hear much about it. You know, and I haven't been in crypto that long, but Lightning Network and Bitcoin. So what, what's the plan? What are you guys really going for? Yeah, okay. Um, so the original vision of Bitcoin, the vision that uh, seems to have been forsaken by a lot of people, is to be an electronic cash system. Uh, Satoshi, whoever he or she or they was or were, uh, yep. uh, they wanted the uh, stateless money. They wanted some kind of a commodity that could be used as a medium of exchange without being tied down to any uh, regime. Mm -hmm. That was the point. And a lot of people tried to work towards this point, but couldn't crack, crack the way to actually do it. Like the, the famous trade-off is the trilemma, the Bitcoin trilemma. You hear, hear it uh, pop up every so often. And um, some people uh, devised different approaches to it and different con concessions to it to achieve it uh, for some uh, some prices 
Uh, I'll get into it more quantitatively in a minute. Um, I think the vision here, uh, what we are trying to, to, to communicate here is that uh, Dagla, uh, Dag Knight and Ghost Dag, Caspa in general, uh, manages to achieve this without much uh, concession. Like, there are trade-offs, there are uh, disadvantages that come with our design, but I think they are very minor compared to what we accomplished. Now, this was Litecoin's original narrative too. They said Bitcoin become a store of value, we want to be cash. Um, so that was the goal of the project. But when you look at uh, what they've done, um, I think uh, Jonathan described it as a, a superficial parameter change for uh, Bitcoin. Okay. It, it doesn't uh, address the core problems with using a blockchain for uh, something which has a global scale. Now, Lightning is another approach that uh, people attempted to, to oversee, overcome this. There, it's something like, no, there is this very broad uh, idea of using uh, Bitcoin or a blockchain as a settlement layer. Right. You, I hear that with Ethereum now too, with all the burning. Yes. Um, Ethereum does something a bit different, but I think... The, the general idea and the abstract idea is that you do stuff off-chain and then you just settle them on-chain. So, for example, in uh, Lightning, uh, you and I can open a channel and each of us puts some, uh, so, some Bitcoin on the channel and then we can pay each other on the channel and we never do it on the block. We don't waste any block space for this. Only when we want to close the channel and like say, okay, we are done here. Our business is concluded. You take what's yours, I take what's mine. And on the blockchain, there's just enough data to know that the way the money was divided uh, at the end of the communication is actually reflects what happened between us on the channel. This is the idea. So uh, if, if, I don't know, you're a coffee stand owner and I buy a lot of coffee and I bought 500 cups of coffee, and then I moved to a different town and said, okay, let's settle up the tab. Then only the one time I paid you for 500 cups of coffee we would appear there. It, it's yeah. not as wasteful. So it's a nice idea. Um, I think uh, Lightning is a very cool, very interesting protocol. Uh, don't get me wrong. I, I, I really like Lightning. Uh, I think things start to break when people... Uh, try to argue that Lightning can go to a global scale. It could theoretically do it, I guess, but there are problems. And there are, I would even say, you trade off a lot of security. Now, if you go into Jonathan's uh, Twitter, uh, if you're already there, you see that uh, a few days ago, he published um, a series of tweets where he talked just about uh, one problematic aspect of thing using uh, the Lightning Network, the Lightning Network globally, it is that if something goes wrong with one channel, mm -hmm. then you can't really go go a little bit up. It's up here. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's the it's the first one. So uh, a big issue with the Lightning Network is that you can have something go wrong in one part of the network and the entire network would be agnostic to it. It's not like in Bitcoin where uh, um, I can cheat. Uh, I can't try to double spend without the entire network finding out. It's, it's, it's too localized. You don't really have the security of the entire network when you work this way. And there are a lot of other issues, routing issues. Like, you know, if I want to pay someone else and they say, okay, you don't have to open a channel between every two users in the system because that's that's insane. It, yeah. it goes, <laughs> if you have a thousand users, you would have about a thousand squared channels, one for yeah. each pair of users. Yeah. It's wasteful. So the, the, the argument is that you can do some sort of routing. Like, I don't have to have a channel with you to trade with you. There has to be some way to hop across channels from me to you. And if by stroke of luck, 
all of these channels have enough money for me to get to you. And if by stroke of luck, none of the channels just uh, closes before our business is concluded, then maybe we could do some stuff. And people hope this could be happening in a decentralized way. It doesn't. And the way they approach it now is to use what they call a watchtower. That was the, the joke from earlier. Right. So a watchtower, I don't know exactly what it is. I, I was never too interested, but I, can, I know that uh, it's some sort of service provider that kind of connects to two segments which are connected to each other by channel. So it, it like does this global um, routing for you, but in exchange, like the entire fragment of users of this watchtower it's centralized. They, this watchtower manages the economy for them. So I, I don't say it's, I don't want to give my a judgment on it. I'm just saying this is yeah. the trade-off. The, the Lightning Network allows them to get um, more throughput at the cost of compromising security and scalability at the, the ways I describe now. Uh, people can come and argue that this is a reasonable trade-off. I can't say that they are wrong. Right. What I can say is that I think that Casper's trade-off are much better. So would so Casper essentially the same thing? Would would Casper be something potentially like just sticking with the Lightning Network uh, side of this, where Casper uses Bitcoin, or is it really just like a silver gold type of thing where you have Bitcoin, which is just a store of value type thing, <laughs> and then Casper is just used as its own separate network as cash? It's it a completely independent network. It's completely a, independent. The, okay. the connections, the relations between Casper and Bitcoin are theoretic. Essentially, okay. in Casper, we have this parameter, which is called K. Mm -hmm. And yep. if you That's set like K to wish, zero, right? it's uh, not exactly, almost. It's it's what's called this is anti size. And there's no, no reason to understand it exactly. But yeah, it somehow limits the width of the graph. Uh, gotcha. If you set K to zero then the DAG must be a chain, and you recover Bitcoin. Gotcha. Yeah. I think you mentioned that somewhere in here, too. Yeah, so yeah, go, go a bit up. If we choose K up. equals zero and discard blocks, yes. we remain with the longest chain. I think this is what you... Um, go yes. up. So if you go a bit up, uh, you see all the... No, no, just uh, this uh, colorful diagram oh, in the middle. Yeah, so if you look at this block B... And you know, look at all the blocks in the in the blue blob. Yep. And so all this block has have this property that um, they are neither in the future nor in the past of B. There is no way to get from them to B or from B to them. Okay. Right? They are like parallel to B. Yeah. Except for I saw that. This picture has a mistake in it, and I'm guessing it's this block here. Yes, you're definitely <laughs> right. I never got around to fix this. Yeah. But it's a good catch. So almost of the, all of the blob. But yeah. imagine for a minute that this arrow isn't there. So if this arrow isn't there, then it, it is accurate. And um, K is, means what is the largest anticon that we allow. Okay. So if you say k equals zero, there are no anticons, means there are no parallel blocks. All of the blocks are in a chain, and you get gotcha. this. Way. Okay. So this stuff all kind of like, these just kind of work together. This is where it just gets kind of over my head with some of the stuff. That's why I was, I was kind of wondering, you know, you've got, <laughs> my first thought when I, when I found, when I learned, started learning about Casper was, I, I didn't consider that it is a block DAG, not just a DAG. Because I had heard similar centralization issues when it comes to like uh, witnesses. I, I can't remember if it's IOTA or another one that uses witnesses. And then one of them uses a coordinator. But CASPA doesn't need any of those because it's no. a block DAG, right? Yeah, no, I, I don't like this thing where, where there's distinctions between a DAG and a block DAG. Okay. And I think there is like, it's the terminology, it's set already. And people made up their mind. Um, I think it's misleading. Okay. Um, and what people call a DAG is just exactly the same as a block DAG, only it only has one transaction per block. Okay. Uh, that's the thing. They, they think they de don't put the blocks on the structure, but the transactions on the structure is completely equivalent to just saying 
each block only has one transaction. Okay. Th that's not the point. Um, like the problem here is that you want to, okay, you have a DAG, right? Uh -huh. You have like, uh, if we look at this figure, you see that you have in this figure two blocks that are not aware of each other, right? Two blocks that uh, are neither in the past nor in the future of each other, right? Yeah. And each of these blocks contains transactions, right? Yeah. So what if they contain conflicting transactions, a double spend? In one of the blocks, you have, I pay some money to you, some CASPA to you. And in the other block, I pay the same CASPA to someone else. Mm -hmm. And you can say that neither of the blocks is invalid, right? Because every block is consistent with all the blocks that they know. So... Right. How do you sort this out? How do you um, solve this problem of having this uh, conflicting transactions? In Bitcoin, it's very simple. Everything is ordered in, the, ordered in a chain, and you're not allowed to put any block with a transaction which uh, contradicts a preceding transaction. But right. here you have two blocks with conflicting transactions, and neither of the blocks is preceding any of the other blocks. So the way to do it is to find some way to determine an ordering of the blocks, to say, okay, we're taking this DAG and we turn it into a chain. Okay. And if I have two blocks with conflicting transactions, I don't discard the entire block. I'm just saying, okay, I'll take it from the block which is uh, higher in the order, which is like, I think of it as more precedent. Yes. Yeah, makes so, sense. So you guys have like math and you guys sort of figured that out on the, so you don't need a witness to say, or a coordinator to, to pick. It's just yeah. there's like a time element and probably some other awesome. Yes, the thing formulas. is that there are many ways to do it. Uh, okay. You could say IOTA tried to do the same thing. Um, but finding a way to do it with is secure is the hard thing. Um, I think if I remember correctly what happened with IOTA, and I'm strictly speaking now about Tangle One, right? What all I'm talking about. Uh, IOTA are aware of it, and this is the reason they, 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 they are making the move to Tangle 2, okay? So they are aware of it. They came up with a solution. I don't know much about this solution, so I can't say uh, anything critical about it. It could yeah. be amazing. I, I don't know. Um, I can tell you that the issue they faced uh, is the same issues that uh, I think also Jonathan faced. Uh, okay, let me take this a bit back. You have okay. this thing called Ghost, right? Not Ghost DAG, just Ghost. Mm -hmm. The thing that uh, Ethereum uh, wanted to implement. So yep. What Ghost does? What, what, why is it useful? Um, so you have this uh, orphan blocks, right? Two blocks are created at the same time. And one of them is going to get discarded in Bitcoin, yes. right? Mm -hmm. um, so Ghost kind of allows you to discard the transactions in the block, but still take into account the, the work done to create this block. So like, if this block is a part of the honest chain, even though it got discarded, in the sense that the transactions on this block are not considered valid transactions or part of the state, mm -hmm. it still adds weight to the honest chain. Okay. So even though there are orphans, the honest chain still gains the weight, partially get, gains the weight of these orphans. So it's not as bad that you have orphan blocks as composed to Bitcoin where the work gets completely wasted. Right. Okay. And now people, the, the, the uh, natural question to ask is, why do we even discard the transactions? Let's, if we keep the work, let's also keep the transactions. Right. When you try to do this, and you can say essentially that that's what IOTA tried to do, like they, they, they didn't take Ghost and try to do this directly, but I think after much uh, uh, deliberation and trying to understand what IOTA does do, we realize that it's essentially um, a stochastic version of Ghost where you also keep, get to keep the transactions, you run into an issue called liveliness. Um, liveliness is that when people talk about uh, attacking a blockchain, they usually talk about a double spend, right? Yeah. A double spend attack is an attack where you spend some money and then an arbitrary long time later, you spend it, you manage to revert the transaction and spend it again. 
Um, a liveliness attack is a more subtle attack where you can create two conflicting transactions and never let the network decide which of these two transactions is the correct one. So like in IOTA, what they did is essentially they said, okay, you have two conflicting transactions. Once one of these transactions is uh, has much more weight, much more work above it than the other transaction, then you can consider the other transaction uh, invalid. Just take the one which is weight. But what happens when an attacker, aware of this, keeps adding a block above the... The valid transactions? No, you can't say the invalid transactions because the network hasn't determined yet. But Okay. At it, at the attacker, uh, all of the time, he um, adds more weight to the one, to the transaction with less weight. So if the network is starting to converge on one of the options, he deliberately adds weight to the other option and keeps the conflict going indefinitely. Ah, uh, gotcha, okay. That, that's what's called a liveness attack. And that's, I think, what killed Tangle 1. That's the reason... Uh, um, IOTA, I think, I don't, don't quote me on that, okay? I'm not an expert on IOTA. Yeah, no worries, but, no worries. We're just... Yes, I'm, I'm saying to the crowd here, that that's how, the way I understand things, that my, they might not be completely representative of what happened, but I think the bold strokes are pretty much uh, the same, that uh, this liveness issue is, uh, is an example of why it's so hard to, to order DAGs uh, in a okay. secure way. But, so, you guys, also, hmm? but you guys think that you figured that out? Essentially, we know that we figured it out. I proved it. Okay, I, cool. I wrote a proof. It took me. <laughs> it took me almost a year, but I did it. Okay. And I'm thoroughly convinced that um, that the the result is uh, secure. Okay. Protocol, and uh, this protocol um, also converges very very fast. The ordering converges very fast. What determines how fast the the protocol converges is essentially just the latency of the network. So it's like the best possible thing. Okay. And that is the latency. I forget. I was asking about that in the Discord. I forget which uh, which article I was looking at. But is that being solved with with Dagnite? Like there's there was something. There was like two versions of it where the latency could be uh, like the yeah. block time. And then it was also something else. Is that a Dagnite thing or is that a Rust thing no neither of these uh, okay I, I can explain both of these things each of them is its own tangent so do you want me to start yeah. with the uh, dag night or do you want me to start with rust um let's start with since we're already talking about the dags let's 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 stick with dag let's go with dag night yeah okay so um the the core limitation of bitcoin of the traditional blockchains is that you can't increase the uh, block rates too much. If you do so, then you increase the orphan rate and then you get wasted work. If if you take Bitcoin right now and reduce the the block uh, the, the block delay between two blocks, you say, okay, it's not 10 minutes now, it's 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. What's going to happen is that, uh, I don't know, like half of the blocks will go, are going to go to the trash, right? Because they were, a lot of blocks are going to be created in parallel. And then the, the network would eventually prefer one of them and the other one is going to get wasted. Yeah. Um, so only half of the network's work actually contributes to the honest chain. So it means that an attacker wishing to understand doesn't need to be as strong as the network anymore. It, could, it only needs to be half as strong as the network. It's, he only has to compete with the rate at which the network creates blocks which aren't discarded. Gotcha. Okay. So this is the core reason. This is the scaling issue. This is the heart of why it's hard to scale blockchains. Now, in Bitcoin's current rate, they discard, I think, the most uh, promiscuous uh, uh, estimates say they discard one in uh, every 150 blocks, which is like negligible. You can say that they don't discard blocks uh, for intents of like, security analysis. Uh -huh. um, but if they try to increase this rate, they are going to decrease the security very, very fast. Okay. Um, so the problem is how you overcome that. And the, the consequence of this, if you, actually, you, if you open the Bitcoin paper and you see 
the, the statement of the theorem, it actually says the security is subject to the condition that the block delay is orders of magnitude larger than the network delay. Okay. You need, if, if your network delay is in the seconds, you would have to have block delays in the minutes. Otherwise, okay. the security, security, oh, I, it's not in the original Bitcoin paper. It's, uh, I think it's, uh, it's in an, an, an yeah, analysis. I guess, I guess that makes sense. You have the whole block, right? So 10 minutes, and then if the network delay, then you can have time in there. Am I thinking of this correctly? For everything to kind of work out, whereas if you have a block time that's smaller and the network delay that's longer, that wouldn't even make sense. Yes, it, the thing is, if, uh, the more, the closer your block time, the, the delay between blocks is to the network delay, um, the, you'll, you'll just see more blocks in parallel. Right? Because okay. if it takes the block five seconds to traverse the network and it takes 30 seconds for the, to create a new block, then the, you would see about the sixth of the blocks going right, through. Right. Yes. Yeah. So um, this is a problem. This is why they say Bitcoin is unscaled. And there are many ways to interpret what the trilemma means, but one of them is to, is one uh, decent and actually quite a strong interpretation is to say that we want to remove this limitation. We want we want to create a protocol which remains secure regardless of the block rates. Um, or the, you can say regardless of the block rates because obviously if we now take Casper and make it do a million blocks a second, things would break. Right. right? And the security will also break. And so a more accurate thing to say is that they are only governed by the network latency. Okay. Um, yeah. And this this is um, this is what we managed to do. Like if you take the you take the the theorem about Bitcoin security and you take the theorem about Casper security and compare them, you see that the main difference is that in the Bitcoin the theorem you have to assume that the block delay is much larger than the network delay, and in the Casper theorem you do not. That, that's this. Tiny, tiny uh, <laughs> thing like this half a line of text is the entire difference between not solving the trilemma and solving the trilemma. Okay. So how um, can we? How can we? So one more time, just so because that sounds huge. That sounds like that's the biggest difference. So what? So what's happening then? Is Casp was saying? So so Bitcoin has ten minutes and it's set in mm -hmm. stone, correct? What do you mean set in stone? It's, uh, uh, like, like, I mean, I know that they could probably go and change the code, right? But the big... Yeah, the it requires big, a hard fork. Yeah, you can't, right, really, right. you can't reduce it without a hard fork. Right. So it's set in stone without a hard fork, right? Bitcoin right mm -hmm. now. And so what, what, what you're saying is that Caspa actually has a way to determine and change the latency based no, on the load no. of the network? No, you, 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 are, uh, you are rushing it a little bit. The, that's <laughs> okay. the difference between Ghost Dog and Dark Knight. I'm, I'm slowly building there. Okay, okay. So the thing is, I say that you, you are allowed to increase the, um, the block rate, but you do have the, to, the, the block rate would somehow uh, correspond to the network latency. Okay. Um, uh, the, the, it's a bit uh, difficult to, to go into the numbers, yeah. but the point is that you estimate the network latency and then you, you say, okay, I'm willing to withstand, uh, I don't know, like 48% attacks. Uh, and from this, you can calculate um, the width that you can support okay. and the block width you can support. Um, but the thing is that you have to do it in advance. Okay. You you have to like uh, have some estimate of the network latency and parameterize your system according to it. And this um, is what Ghost, this is what Ghost Dag is doing. This is what Ghost Dag does, and okay. it, it's amazing on its own because you see Ghost Dag now is on a uh, one block per second. After yep. Rust, we'll have thirty blocks per second, and uh, this is just based on conservative estimates. Now the problem with using an estimate, it, it's twofold. 
it, it you can ask yourself two things one is what happens if the network is actually slower than I estimated the other is what's if it's actually faster than I estimated if it's faster than what you estimated then you essentially um, aren't as fast as you could be you could be operate faster and still be secure so it's a bit wasteful so you oh. you're not uh, um, applying uh, leveraging the resource you have to its fullest now that's not doesn't sound too bad until you think about the other direction if the network is slower than you estimated then security goes to hell again uh, okay because uh, I I don't want to get into this but your estimate must you must have a you sufficiently large margin of error for things to be secure and, and this is just back to the previous point because if you have a large margin of error then necessarily necessarily you are not as um as fast as you could be yeah so Now, it's efficient the versus secure right hmm? efficiency versus security exactly on... okay so we can scale but we The, the amount of scaling we can do is still uh, limited by, by the network and we are forced to take a margin of error. So the miraculous thing about ghost duck, about uh, Dark Knight is that it's what we call parameterless. Maybe you have held this term thrown yeah. around parameterlessness. Yeah. It essentially means that you don't have to hardwire the an estimate for the network scale for the network speed. It automatically knows, How to adjust itself to um, varying network conditions. So on one hand, when things are healthy, you can run as fast as the network permits. You don't need to have the safety margin anymore. Mm-hmm. You are at top efficiency. And on the other hand, if the network deteriorates even dramatically, then goes the Dag Knight will automatically adjust itself. So it's both faster and more secure. And I think, I've said this sentence many times and it sounds like I'm hyping it but I truly believe it that Dagnight is the perfect uh, proof of work uh, concerns this protocol if you make a desiderata of everything you'd wish of a protocol <laughs> then you'd say that you I couldn't come up with anything else on, on this consensus side there are other aspects like the hash algorithm you use and this stuff but It's, it's a completely orthogonal discussion. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, uh, Dag Knight or Ghost Dag or Bitcoin or any consensus protocol is completely agnostic to the uh, hashing algo you used for mining. It's a completely different uh, discussion. But um, Dag Knight essentially achieves everything you could wish for from, uh, from a proof of work protocol, which is uh, why it's so miraculous. Um, the only thing... That I don't like about it is that it's really hard to understand it's a uh, I uh, ghost dug I think anyone with a, a thorough understanding of Bitcoin and willingness to put in a few days of a uh, hard thought and reflection could uh, understand exactly what's going on and and In Ghost Dog and uh, so Agnite is like the next, like a, yes, you know, like a mathematician it's, it's, level kind of it's like rocket science. It's just rocket science. It's, it has a lot of layers of complexity, uh, a lot of problems. It required a lot of, uh, of ingenuity. It's, it's, uh, it's a work of art. I, I really appreciate uh, Michael and Jonathan for being able to come up with such, such a gem. And cool. I'm so glad that it's going to get implemented. So is, is that, I think I heard someone say somewhere that, uh, someone say somewhere, how vague can I be? I heard someone say that this dynamic, the, the latency thing that you're referring to, that Dagnite is going to be implementing, or that the feature of Dagnite is something that was previously deemed impossible. Is that true? Or is that, like, is it that big of a thing? Or is it, you know... Um, is that just kind of an exaggeration? I think the person you heard say it is uh, Jonathan. <laughs> it might um, have been one of these articles I read. I don't know. Yes, there is a video going around where uh, he says, um, he, he said something else. He said that um, he doesn't think that uh, this kind of feature is possible without proof of work. You okay. could never have... 
Uh, I tried to call it self-scaling, the name didn't catch on. Um, um, you could never, you, uh, we, we don't have a proof of this, it's not like a mathematical argument, but there are reasons, strong reasons to believe that um, proof of work is essential for being able to, to um, react to varying network conditions in a decentralized permissionless system. Interesting, okay. Um, and it's not the first time something like this happened. Like, Bitcoin does something which was considered impossible. Um, it manages to create a, a decentralized uh, design time agreement of, uh, which is resilient for, against 49% attackers despite a theorem, a mathematical proven well-established theorem which says that it's impossible. The, the design time general theorem, also known as the... Um, 2F plus 1 theorem, uh, it essentially says that if more than a third of the uh, parties in your network are dishonest, then they can attack the network. They can do harmful stuff. Mm -hmm. So how come Bitcoin contradicts this theorem? Uh, the answer is that this theorem is in a particular model and Bitcoin came up with an idea to to go beyond this model. The, you can think of Bitcoin as existing in a world where you have this magical box that can tell you an estimation of how much time has passed. Like this is the entire point of proof of work. You see a proof, you see a, a valid block, and you, you have very good reasons to assume that it actually took 10 minutes to create this block. <laughs> and when you allow such an assumption of provable passage of time, then you can do things that you can't do without this assumption, and that's exactly what Bitcoin did. Okay. Yeah, cool. I guess that's true. It's impossible till it's not impossible. Like the uh, yeah. sub, was it, was it the sub four-minute mile or five-minute mile or whatever? It was like, no, no one can run a mile faster than five minutes. Until someone does it, then the year following, it's like 100 people do it. Yes. But, uh, okay. Someone finds the way. Yeah, someone finds a way, and then it opens up everyone's mental capacity for things okay um i mean this has been great uh so we so the next thing to really talk about then so dag dag night when is the is there a timeline for that implementation or is that kind of just one of those floating uh sometime in the future type things um uh, it, there isn't a strict calendar um, yeah. but it's not like it's gonna happen when it happens it would have been it's going to happen when it happens if there wasn't a crowdfund. And now that uh, we have raised funds for it, then the, we are uh, obligated to this um, um, timeline. It's not a timeline. It's not a strict schedule, but we we are going to finish with Rust. We are going to stabilize Rust. I'm saying we, but I have nothing to do with Rust. <laughs> Michael Sutton like, mostly over there. Michael, Michael and Delichai and Dory and the heroes uh, are going to um, make, make Rust uh, stabilized and uh, bring it into maintenance mode. And then the work on Ghost Dog is going to start. Um, we can't... We, the reason we don't commit to a timeline is not because we're lazy. It's because you really can't know no, that, how yeah. long it's going to take. Yeah, no and, doubt. Uh, uh, I think... Uh, like maybe sometime this year? I mean, there's 10 months left. Or it could be... Uh, it sometime. could happen. It could be. It could be... Um, like in in B, in beta, maybe it, uh, it could be by the end of the year. But I, cool. I don't want to commit to anything, especially because I'm not the one coordinating this. Yeah, fair. Um, I think uh, fair. Michael Sutton is the the guy to ask. Okay. Um, yes, yeah, so take, take that. No deadlines here. Just with a grain of salt, a little bit hopefulness that maybe, maybe by the end of the year. But don't put yeah, your money on. It's, even, it's not a maybe, maybe in the sense that uh, if a miracle happens, it's reasonable. I just, okay, I yeah. don't want to promise. Okay. It's not that, my best promise. Only Michael has the authority to say, uh, I think we're going to release before this point in time. I'm just oh. guessing here like anyone. I may, may have a bit more um, uh, knowledge in my estimate. It's less of a guess, but still, I'm just uh, watching this from the outside at this point. Okay. Um, oh. Only Michael knows exactly 
what goes what would go into doing this effort and uh, what it takes okay so um what is so rust is going to increase the blocks per second right is that the the main goal for this rust yes right so, as i said um the the entire uh, what makes ghost tag amazing is that um we removed the um the the, the I'm sorry. What makes Ghost Dog impressive is that we removed the bottleneck, the security bottleneck for block throughput. You can increase block rate. You can increase block rates um, as long as the block rates are not too high that the network can't handle them. You okay. need. Uh, you only have the only constraints are hardware constraints and uh, network constraints. Okay. Now, this means that if you have an efficient implementation, you can increase the throughput. In Bitcoin, if you now take the Bitcoin uh, Bitcoin client and rewrite it so it's 10 times more efficient, mm -hmm. you'd still have to wait 10 minutes between the blocks because this constraint doesn't come from the hardware. It comes from the security of the protocol. Okay. We don't have this. The constraint is the speed of the machines of the network and the connections between them. So if our efficient is more, if our implementation is more efficient, then we can support higher rates. Now, when we, uh, the, the original implementations was written in Golang, um, it wasn't, it's not an, a, uh, um, uh, performance oriented language and it wasn't written it was written in a performance oriented mindset but there were some uh, choices that had to be made along the way that uh, in retrospect could have been uh, made uh, we might have chosen differently uh, in retrospect in hindsight and the point of rust is to take all of this uh, accumulated experience and restart from the ground up in a much more uh, um, performance-oriented mindset and language. And now one of the things about Rust that it's very good for parallelizations. If you have a lot of CPUs and you want to use them concurrently, then Rust is terrific for that. And this is exactly what you have. You have this DAG structure. Yeah. You have blocks that are parallel to each other. You, you don't need to verify this block before you verify that block. There are many blocks that you can verify at the same time and verifying blocks, going over the blocks and verifying the digital signatures is the heaviest part of all this. So the DAG structures allows us to do this very, very concurrently. Unlike say in Bitcoin where you can't really move on to the next block before you verify this block because you need to know yeah, every transaction, so you need to check that it doesn't contradict a transaction in a previous block. So you you are really, really uh, within the block, you can do some stuff concurrently, but it's not the same thing. Yeah. Um, the entire architecture of the Rust uh, uh, re-implementation relies on this fact that there are many blocks that are parallel to each other and they are not dependent on each other, so you can just verify them at the same time. So use a language which is very good at letting you use the many processors on your... Uh, system and you know like uh, the crummiest laptops today have eight cpus yeah i mean so <laughs> why not the, use it so um, and this is what allows us to get these uh, uh, incredible benchmarks um the rust implementation seems to work about uh, 200 times faster than wow. uh, than the golang implementations uh, which means that we can do 30 blocks per second um, the, the fact that it works 200 times faster doesn't mean that we can go 200 times more blocks because when you increase the block rate then the, the graph becomes wider and it requires more resources to process so it's like there is a balance but it seems to the, the 30 blocks um, benchmark seems to be very very within very much within the reasonable. Yeah, that's what I brought, I brought this up just for like an illustration that Michael had shared 
where he's yeah, got, exactly uh, but right. I couldn't quite understand it. I was like, okay, so we've got block processing rate and the network blocks per second. And I had to just have a hard time, but I did see here where he said that, you know, it leaves a margin yes. of uh, safety. And so mm -hmm. at about 30 blocks. And then I was talking with another guy in the discord and he was saying that at about 30 blocks, that would be about 4,500 transactions per second. With what can you put in there? Does that sound about right to you? I think it should be more. Okay. So I think uh, a block can have about uh, 400 transactions. Uh, just, yeah, with something uh, like it can have it can have that many, but then you, you're going to have one input and then multiple outputs. So it was like if you factor in that there's three, but really possibly one, and then sort of do them at Tim and Discord. Yeah, the, this is the... Out. This is what makes this computation hard because there isn't a fixed size ah, of a okay. transaction. You see, the, the, it really depends on the, how many inputs and outputs out of the transactions, and transactions can have uh, different kinds of uh, signatures and uh, different kinds of data. So it's, it's really hard to say exactly how much. But uh, let's say we have 400 uh, transactions per block. Yep. Um, so 30 blocks per second, it comes up to like 1,200 transactions, 12,000 transactions per second, right? Yeah. Um, I remember, yeah, that, I'm not that'd, be, that'd be closer, yeah, 12,000. And then what he did in the Discord was divide that by like a third. It's like we were saying with the UTXOs. He was like, yeah, if you have blah, blah, blah. And, and <laughs> no, so I think, uh, no, it should be the other way around. The thing is, you, you're going to have parallel transactions. You're going to have the, the, the same transaction in several blocks, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not really fair to count them. Yeah, okay. you can support 1,200 uh, transactions, uh, 12,000 transactions, but uh, a lot of these transactions are going to be duplicate. So mm. how many unique transactions are you, are you going to get? Which is a right. if, if all parallel blocks have the same transactions, then this entire DAG thing is kind of stupid. Just do a chain, right? Yeah. You haven't really achieved anything. So the math behind it, behind this is, uh, is uh, I think, a bit surprisingly deep. Um, the point is that uh, um, you're, you need to enter the mindset of a miner and say, okay, what's the best way for me to choose the transactions? How do I pick transactions from the mempool such that the my profit is maximized? Right. And if you do the math, you see that uh, they sort of choose the transactions randomly. They give some a bit more priority to transactions which pay higher fees, but there is a whole lot of randomness in this process. Okay. Um, and then you do the math, and you see that in the worst case, the worst case is when the size of the mempool is exactly the capacity of the blocks. If if you have like a, a, you, ex, you you expect like to have like a hundred parallel blocks at every moment, and each block can contain four hundred transactions, so they all can together can contain forty thousand transactions, right? Yeah. Uh, so if you have like the exactly this amount of transactions in the mempool. Then that's where you get the most, the, the largest amount of uh, of, pa of uh, parallel transactions. If you have less than that, then um, you don't get as many collisions. You will. It doesn't matter because you'll put most of them. So, like if you have less than that, then you don't get a lot of unique transactions just because you don't have a lot of transactions. It's not a problem. It's just. Gotcha. Makes sense. You can't boot more transactions that exist. If you have more, like a lot more than that, then obviously you're going to get a lot less collisions because people are being random. The, the probability for collisions um, it just decreases if, you have, if the mempool is very, very full. So like the, the minimum, the, the worst place is when you have exactly this amount and you can do the math and see that in the worst, worst case, uh, when you take the block rate to infinity, you see that this thing converges to about 63%. If you want to be more accurate about it, it, it goes to about 1 minus 1 over E. 
Okay. <laughs> I was going to say. <laughs> it's about 63%. So, and this is, as I said, it's, it converges to this. This is the worst case. Since we are not in an infinite blocks, just like a, a lot of blocks, and since most of the time we expect the map will not to be at this exact point, uh, I think uh, I, it could be expected that we'll see at least 80% of okay. unique transactions. 20% of the transactions would be repeats. So I'd say if we can hold 12,000 transactions per second, we would see about 10,000 unique transactions per second. Yeah. And if we don't, if in practice we, we think it's too low, there are also ways to overcome that. We can like bucket transactions and say that okay. blocks can only contain transactions which uh, have they relate the hash of the block to the hash of the transactions and like bucket the transactions and this is oh. reduces collision rates and there are a whole lot of other tricks you can do. But I think that uh, it won't be necessary. I think we're going to see about 80% um, okay. unique yeah, transactions. I, I was kind of thinking because Visa with their transactions per second, you know, like on, on specific holidays, at least in the United States, you know, around Christmas time and Thanksgiving, their tra the transactions per second could be in like the 20,000s or whatever. And I was like, if that was going to be a blockchain doing this, like say Casper was doing it and it's at 10,000, as you said, I thought it was at 4,000, but let's say it's at 10,000 and you have those spike days. Like what happens is the whole chain just break Do transactions, just not go through. Like what happens during times like that? Um, during times like that, you just, it, it, in Bitcoin, it happens all the time. I think the, the Bitcoin blocks are full of all of the time for like years now. You just, People are gonna have to wait their time. Okay. Uh, that's yeah. what's gonna happen. <laughs> it, is, it doesn't gonna compromise the network in any way. Okay. It's cool. just gonna mean that uh, people are gonna fight uh, over space and pe that the fees are gonna increase because people will. Some people will just say, "Ah, what, whenever is whenever." Other people are gonna pay more fees to get more presents. Yeah. President. It's not necessarily a bad thing, right? Because um, you want to have fees because. Fees are what rewards the miners. Right now we have block rewards, but in the long term, uh, yeah, block like, rewards diminish. I thought it was kind of cool. I, I looked at Bitcoin's block rewards and Caspa's, and it looks like they both sort of arrive at around like 90% out there by like 2026, 2027 <laughs> or something like that. So it'll be interesting to see. Both of them will be almost at the end of the block reward rope by that point, and it'll be interesting to see how the fees stack up for both yeah. networks. In sustainability, yeah. Now some people uh, they they try to hold this against Casper. The same, no, yeah. I don't, I don't see any. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't really have necessarily a problem with it because you guys fair launched it. You guys were mining just with everybody else, and you can even say that about Bitcoin. The first three years about Bitcoin, like who really knew it? People were mining it. Uh, so I, I don't really have an, an issue with with that. It, I think I think it'll be interesting because I don't know of any other proof of work networks that have their emissions um, in terms of block awards almost at zero yet. Okay. Yes, so I, cool. I think I think it's that's a bad thing. I think people sometimes uh, criticize a decision to to go with uh, such a fast emission schedule. Uh -huh. When you see other proof of work, um, they're gonna keep emitting rewards for like uh, two hundred years. Yeah. I, it's like I think. <coughs> it's really unconventional to see um, uh, such a fast emission schedule. And I think that uh, this slow emission schedule is one of the things which I find uh, problematic in the, in general, I have like this entire tirade about uh, things that uh, displease me about the, the practices and the, and standards that uh, in the, crypto space and especially in the proof of work crypto space and a lot of the decisions we made uh, are an attempt to go against this like uh, being fair launched um, and refusing to to work on the higher level uh, stuff and smart contracts before we this we we feel that our the core of our technology is uh, ripe um but one thing that i don't like is this very very long um, emission rates because eventually eventually fees are what's supposed to keep the network alive fees are the rewards 
the block yeah. rewards are just like this temporary thing which is supposed to um to spread out the money to create uh, engagement and to create adoption yeah but eventually for your chain to be sustainable it has to be able to fund it fund itself off of fees and when um, people create blockchains with emissions rage emission schedules which aren't going to end um, before their grand grandchildrens have their own grandchildren they are they're essentially saying um, we are not going to see it in our lifetime within our lifetime we are not going to see if this technology we made is sufficiently adopted to be sustainable and uh, we don't want that we want to create a, a tech which is adopted and sustainable within our lifetime you can't do that when this preliminary phase which is just supposed to kick start things off lasts literally 200 years it doesn't <laughs> make sense and i think people don't go with the mission uh, schedules because uh, there is something a bit uh, um, scary about it it's it's a risky choice um, but i think uh, it's the only way to go i think if you want to show the world that your network is sustainable you want to show the world that it manages to fund itself and to sustain its security without relying on high block rewards um uh, that's one thing about the emission schedule uh, another thing is that i think I'm going to say something which might sound very counterintuitive. It sounded con- counterintuitive to me too when Yoni first said it to me. But okay. he sa- I said, isn't the emission schedule kind of fast? And he said, it's slower than Bitcoins. And I'm like, uh, what are you talking about? Bitcoin is going to end in like two, uh, 2157 or something? Uh-huh. And he said, no, but if you factor in the adoption rates, then it's faster than Bitcoin. Um, because um in bitcoin yeah it's right that it was very very slow but the amount of people that got engaged during the first uh, i don't know five or six years six years um it was also very small yeah we don't live in this world anymore true There's all buzz around crypto the se- the second we launched miners came from we were astonished at the uh, block rates and we we know that like you you just three years four years and there are fpgas and then there are asics and we didn't want to create this uh, situation well when the um asics come in and when the the you you would require now asics are innovatability at some point so yeah. there are algorithms which are allegedly asic resistant i don't believe asic resistance is actually possible um But even if it does, our algo is not asic resistant, Bitcoin's algo is not asic resistant. Uh, a lot of proof of works start with uh, already they already launch with ASICs, which is also something which I find Jeez. very distasteful. Yeah, uh, well, you're already like limiting people that can participate right off the bat. Yes. Um, but uh, we know that ASICs are gonna are gonna be there at some point. Yeah. Uh, we want when this point arrives when the asics arrive uh, we don't want 20% of the coin to have been mined we want 90% of the coin to have been mined we don't want the asic holders to own the majority of the coin yeah. and if you go for a 200 year emission schedule there's no way the asics if you if your technology is uh, adopted within your lifetime but 80% of the coin is still out then you know that 80% of the go- coin are going to go to to mining farms which can uh, design and construct their own hardware that's yep. not decentralized no. so yeah i guess it's the Before. safe option if you want to make money but uh, i don't think it would i think it compromises the centralization a lot and this is why we didn't go this route no that's actually a great point i hadn't even considered that Yeah, by the time because that's one thing. No one can mine Bitcoin right now. Like, I mean, profitably. I mean, you could do it, but it doesn't seem very profitable right now. And you got you gotta yes. spend like every two or three years you have to buy it, not to bash it, you know, you gotta upgrade those ASICs to compete. And it's just yes, even if it wasn't the case, if it was if it uh, 
even imagine a, a scenario where the ASICs are, we already have the best ASICs. The, the ASICs are not going to improve anymore. Imagine, it's not the case. Like, I know that uh, ASIC makers go with the uh, plant of solutions. They always have the best ASICs, and when they only release it to the public and for uh, retailers when they've already developed the next generation for themselves. That's, that's okay. the rule. I don't have any evidence, but that's how, how it seems to work. Yeah. Um, um, but disregard it. Even say that we already have the best ASICs, ASICs aren't going to get any better and you can go and buy them. Um, what fraction of the network do you need for, for uh, actually being profitable? You're a miner, you want to see a return on investment every, I don't know, every week? Um, so if you want to see, uh, I actually did the math in one of my uh, threads, but the point is that if you have um, 10,000 times more blocks. Like right now, we have 600 times more blocks than Bitcoins, right? And after the rust, we'll have 18,000 uh, times, right? Something like that, yeah. Something like that. 100 times 30. It means 18, that you yeah. need, like, the amount of hardware you need to see the same. To, to wait the same time for a return on investment in Bitcoin versus Casper, um, assuming they have the same assets and the same size and everything, just like yeah. a mental uh, experiment, um, you're going to need to have a hundred... Uh, in Bitcoin, you have to have 18,000 times more assets to get a return of investment at the same time. It's there... Um, Linearly proportional to each other. If you have more blocks, you need to have less hardware to wait the same amount of time for a return of investment. And they are inversely proportional to each other. Yeah. So this is already... I think this is the main reason why high block rates are desirable. I think the the high throughputs competing with Visa and uh, being a, a very fast uh, cash system which can support a lot of transactions, I think that's a bonus. I think the real importance is that even in the ASIC era, the, the entry barrier would be much lower for seeing reasonable return of, on investment times. That the, the entire dynamic caused by having high block rates and high uh, transaction rates, uh, it just it reduces the, the incentives for pooling. It reduces the... Um, the entry barrier you need as a miner, both as a solo miner and as a pooled miner, um, to to see um, I don't know a weekly return on investment. It's yeah, much more important than uh, than just uh, supporting high volumes of transaction. Gotcha. Are you in the Are you in the mining space? Are you hitting that up or? I'm not a miner. I'm not a trader. I'm not anything. Yeah, I, I can't do that. I thought I'd try to, I just set up a computer here to try to run a node for a hardware project. But yeah, I can't, I don't know any of the hardware stuff, anything like that. But yeah, I never got into mining. I mined, uh, I mined Caspa in the first few weeks on my uh, CPU and home. Nice. I just, I have a gaming laptop, but uh, right, cool. that, that's about it. And uh, cool. it became non competitive very fast. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's about, that's, I mean, that's all I really have. I have, a, I don't know, can you hear the noise going on outside the window right now? No. Okay, <laughs> perfect. Then, then this streaming service is doing well because I have like suddenly construction everywhere and I'm glad it's not interrupting you. I was hoping it wasn't interrupting you. But that's all, that we're at an hour and 15 minutes. I appreciate your time. Sure. Uh, is there anything else that you feel like is awesome for Caspa that you would just kind of like to, to share? And if, if not, that's okay too. We could just like wrap it up. No, I can't go through an interview without mentioning the community. Because uh, the, yeah, community, great. <laughs> the Casper community is, is amazing. Um, this wouldn't have happened without the community. The, we don't have a, a marketing budget. We don't have... Um, we, all we have is the community. And it seems to be infinitely better. I'm sorry, just I have a technical issue. I'm sorry. <laughs> You're good. I, here I am all emotional about how much I love the community and I'm just like... Uh, pushing yeah. stuff around this. But uh, 
the community is what makes this possible for so many aspects. It's not only the insane amount of initiative people are taking at, at doing stuff and promoting the con and you see people talk about Casva and and they know that they are they are not just users, they are not our clients, they are a part of this. We're doing this together. And yeah. the amount of uh, empowerment, the, the amount of encouragement we keep getting, people look up to us and people appreciate what we do and people want to be a part of this together with us. This, this is the real driving force. I mean, the tech is awesome and the tech is essential, but the people believing in it uh, are also absolutely essential. And I just, I can't go through an interview without at least one time uh, doing an shout out to the community and how I love you guys because it wouldn't have happened without you. So yeah, no, I think, like, I think one big, one big part of that is the launch. I think when people feel like everyone is getting a fair shake with the coin distributions and, you know, there was no VCs that, to my knowledge kind of deal. I know early funding with, I think it was Polychain or something, but yes. with what happened with the, the fair launch with the mining and all that seemed good. And I think when a project starts that way, and you've got founders that are transparent and uh, and contributors that talk. I think it makes it easy for the community to get behind it. So it's also the community is almost a reflection of the guys that are are behind the scenes voicing what's going on too. So just to kind of flip that back to you, sir. <laughs> but okay, um, yeah. If, if nothing else, I do appreciate you coming on again. Uh, sure, appreciate you having me. Yeah, thanks for all your insight. And uh, hopefully maybe we could do another one in a few months when there's more developments. Yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, you, can, uh, you can invite me anytime. All right, awesome. Don't forget to give Desha a follow on Twitter. Thank you. I'll see you guys on the next video.